Okay, now how many of you ever sang that song? We three kings of bearing gifts. Okay. Can we try that again? All right. I'm going to give you a count of four. One, two, three. We three kings of Orient. La, 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 la. I, okay, I don't know the lyrics. It's my least favorite, probably my least, it's my least favorite Christmas hymn. But what's the deal with these three kings of Orient are, and incidentally, I did hear they want to cancel that because it's racist. I'm not making this up. All right, someone was complaining they have to take off the playlist of a radio station. All right, okay, I just want to let you know that we're not going to cancel it, although maybe we should because it's not biblical. I don't know if you realize this, but we three kings, first of all, we don't know if there's three kings. In Orient are, first of all, I don't think, is that even grammatically correct? Okay, but what are these three kings? You heard the wise men, right? And some of you have these nativity sets. In the nativity set, you see the little drummer boy. By the way, there ain't no drummer boy. Okay, that's another heresy. Okay, I'm ruining your Christmas. I'm not going to mention anything about guy with a red suit flying around. I'm not going to mention that one. Okay, that's for next week when Pastor Randy shares. But, but um, I'll let him deal with that. Uh, but what, what is it all about? What are these three kings of Orient are? And, and so, the, first of all, they're not even in the stable. And... To make matters worse, they didn't drive a camel or smoke a camel. They had horses. They had, they had, they had horses, okay? And they drove across for a thousand miles to see this promised king. So we're going to learn today from the wise men what it looks like to worship God in power and in strength. And so that's what we're going to do today. You guys ready? Now that I've offended half of you, we'll move on. Okay, let's go ahead and read what the scriptures has to say. We're going to read it through, then we're going to look at what the lessons that you and I can learn from these wise men, not wise guys. Okay? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, Herod was one of the kings. I don't have time to break it all down. He was half Jewish. He was very jealous I don't know if you've ever noticed, but sometimes when politicians are insecure, it causes problems. <laughs> and some of you, when you're insecure, you cause problems. Okay, there we go. Uh, Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Where did they come? Jerusalem, not Bethlehem. You see that? So, you see, I want you, when you go home today, I want you to take your nativity, take the th three wise Men, and I want you to stamp on it and put it in the garbage. Then I want you to get some horses. Okay, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Guys, relax. You, you never... <laughs> Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, wait a minute here. These guys are far off. Why do they care about the Jewish people? What's the story with that, right? And, and they're like, what is going on? You have to understand, look what happens here. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod and the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why were they troubled by a couple of dudes on a camel? Because there wasn't a couple of dudes on a camera, a, a, camera, a Camry or a camel. There was a consortment, there was a group of wise men coming from the east with an entourage. They had a motorcade of their day. You see, these guys were very well learned. They were educated. They were probably like a, uh, maybe a billionaires of their day, if you will, um, professors of, of prestigious universities. These were people that were highly learned. They wouldn't care about a bunch of bungalows hanging out in Jerusalem coming in with some beat up car. Now these guys came with an entourage, had the flag, you know what I'm talking about when they have a motorcade going through. These, this is the kind of noise these guys made. So it was a big deal. So they more than likely had a security team. They also had a servant team and they would come. I mean, all you have to do is read what happened in, in ancient civilizations, what dignitaries would have. They would have horses, they'd have an entourage with them. It would be a big to do. All right, security team, you name it. You name it. Because back in those days, the travel was very difficult. And they traveled, we believe, for over 1,000 miles. Now, to travel 1,000 miles, even into this day, is a pain. 
because you have to go to the airport. There's a reason they call it a terminal, because you feel you're gonna die when you're at the airport, <laughs> right? It's horrible. I, I don't like going to the airport. If, if it's 10 hours or less, I'll drive, thank you. So these guys, are, are, they're gonna have to travel and a far away, a thousand miles, it might take 18 to 24 months to get there, folks. It takes time, especially with your entourage. So they came a long way, so Herod was like, what is going on? So what happened? All Jerusalem was like, what's the story? What king? What's going on here? And Herod's freaking out because he's got to keep order in his providence. So, and when he had gathered all the chief priests, this is Herod, and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where than where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. So when you don't know what's going on in the world today, it's good to look at the scriptures. And God will often give us information on a need-to-know basis. And sometimes you can see that something is going, what's this star about? What are they talking about? And who are these wise men? What's so interesting is that these wise men are spoken about in the book of Daniel. Let me go ahead and show you what I'm talking about before we read this verse. But, but you, O Bethlehem, here's a prophetic word, right? Written by the prophet. What did the prophet say? But you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel, departed from their own, departed from their own country and they went another way. So what is this all about? There is a prophecy of a coming king. Way back in the prophets. Now what's so interesting is, what has Herod do? Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, he determined from them what time the star appeared. So guys, when did this happen? Well, about 18 to 24 months ago. He did the math. That means the child must be anywhere from 18 to 24 months old. Therefore, let's kill every child, every male child under the age of two. So there was a great abortion and genocide prior to the work of God to take place on the planet. Are we seeing a genocide in the killing of the unborn in our generation? You better believe it because the enemy knows that God has a promise and a plan in the next generations. And the enemy always wants to kill what God's about ready to do. So go and search carefully for the young child, Herod tells him. And when you have found him, bring him back. Bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them. Now, the people have done some astrological calculations, trying to figure out when the planets lined up. And some people think they found the Bethlehem star by going back in time because the, the earth is like, the universe is like a clockwork. We don't really know, but there seems to be a supernatural um, uh, vision that they see as well. So they probably saw a star and then we believe the glory of God helped them until it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they had come into this stable, what does that say? House. They came into the house. So Jesus was in the house. Okay, he was living in a house, and they came to the house. What happens after that? Well, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're gonna explain what that means in a little bit. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They went a different way. So what does all this mean? Who are these magi? These magi would be considered, we get the word magician from. They were looking at the astrological signs. They were also in, involved with divination. They were involved with what we would call today the black arts or perhaps witchcraft or perhaps uh, maybe the New Age movement the other day. Well, how can God would call these people to know Jesus and not tell the Jewish people as, as frankly? Because God is, works through people. You see, there are people today you think are far from God, but they're working and they want to know God. You see, there is a heightened level of interest in the supernatural. There's a heightened level in tarot card readers and all those types of things. Those are bad things, by the way. If you go to those types of people, I encourage you not to because there are dark demons. There are, there are dark, evil demons that will masquerade. Some of them are just charlatans. Some of them actually tap in to the demonic realm, and it's dangerous. 
Just because something is spiritual does not mean it's God. There's evil and there's good. And let me tell you, guys, it's true. I can tell you stories about my great-grandfather and how he put curses on people and they got sick. And all, but that's for next week when Randy preaches. <laughs> so we have expectant worship. <laughs> what's the, he's not going to talk about that. I'm just kidding. But expectant, what's this expectant worship? They believed. They were believing God for something. They believed that God was going to answer. Why? Why would they believe it? Who are these magi? Well, in Daniel 2.2, 2, there's some of these wise men. If you're not familiar with Daniel, what happened, Israelites, they had their own nation. They, they broke into rebellion. And then finally, they were taken into captivity by Babylon. And um, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the biggest and the strongest king of the time, gathered up the brightest and the sharpest minds of, of that generation. And Daniel was one of them. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that disturbed him terribly. So this is what he did. He says he told all of his soothsayers and all the people involved with all these types of things, I want you guys to tell me what I dreamt last night in the meaning. Now what's crazy is, he's, he said, well, tell us, the, tell us the dream. I'm not telling you the dream. You're going to tell me what I dreamed. Now that's impossible for anyone to do. And so they're going to they're gonna slit everyone's throat and kill them. They're going to kill Daniel. Daniel said, what's going on? Well, the king had a he had a he had a, a dream, and he's asking us to know, tell him what the dream is. And he doesn't even tell us what the dream is. And Daniel goes, my God can do it. So we had his friends fast and pray. They had their own 21 days. And he came back, and he went to Nebuchadnezzar, and he told them what his dream was and the meaning of it. So Daniel became like number two in the land. He became popular. He became powerful. Then later on, Persia came and take over the kingdom. Then he was with Darius, and he also rose in prominence there as well. So Daniel was one of the wise men. You see, he, all the other ones couldn't get it right, but Daniel could supernaturally tell what was going on. Listen, everybody, you and I need to tap into what God is doing because in this current day, we're going to start seeing more some weird signs and wonders, and you and I need to have the real signs and wonders through the Holy Spirit. And we're going to need to function in a higher level of anointing. Not to be weird, not to be crazy, not to be showboating, but to work in power. That's why we're going to give God opportunity to work through our lives. That's why we're going to get into the new year. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts and how to operate them simultaneously with the gifts, with the fruit of the Spirit. Because we need to know how to function in this. Not showboating, not being arrogant, not being weird, but being powerful. And so this is what was going on with Daniel. He had a reputation. Not only that... But if you go back to the book of Numbers, there was a guy named Balaam. Don't name your child Balaam. And though Balaam was a, another person who, who was involved with demons and hearing things, and Moab wanted this guy Balaam to curse is, the Israelites while they were in the desert because he was afraid of them. So he hired him to do such. So while he's going to do that, God meets him and says, don't you dare touch my people. You can't do it. It's a long story, but the bottom line is, Balaam says, okay, I'm listening to God. And he prophesies over Israel. And look what he says. He says this, I see him. Isn't that interesting? But not now. In other words, I don't see him now. This is the future. I behold him, but not near. A what? A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons. So he prophesied a star was going to rise. Now, some people believe, some scholars believe that Balaam was one of the, if you will, wise men of his day. And don't forget now, they were taken over by, um, by the Persians. And so this began to happen. Then you have the wise men. Then you have Daniel. So all of this is, is recorded in their, in their traditions and so they study these things. So now they see a star. And they study the stars. What does this mean? They go back in the archives, either through oral tradition or writing, probably writings, and they realize that this guy Balaam said it, perhaps that Daniel said a bunch of things as well. Daniel prophesied when Christ was going to come, by the way. In fact, in Daniel chapter 9, he prophesied that 400 and 83 years were going to happen between what he said and when a, a one is going to rise up and seem like he's a failure. We're just talking about Jesus. I don't have time to get into it all right now. But what's so amazing is people go, well, yeah, but that doesn't add up. But Jesus did not begin his ministry until he was 30. So you subtract 30 from that number, 
you get the, you get the cr- appropriate number, which is 483 years. Pretty wild. Now, I know it's a little bit debatable, and we don't, we don't found theology in these types of things, but the Bible is absolutely, positively amazing. The 66 Bible books you have in your Bible have been thoroughly tested through generations, through, uh, through two millennia, and you can trust your Bible. The Bible is true. The Bible is what we live by. And I'm telling you right now, you can see it more and more. Even people like Joe Rogan are freaking out when these guys come on there and talk about revelation and talking about AI and all these things. And he's looking, oh my Lord, he sees the one world government. And if people like that are seeing it because he's a seeker of truth, right? Even people like Jordan Peterson and other people that are a little out there, but yeah, but they're seeking truth like the wise men. And so you and I have the truth. And so don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Listen, everybody, we have nothing to be ashamed of. The Bible's true, okay? And people are looking, and we need to have answers. Not answers to all their questions about what's gonna happen, but the answer that Christ and God is the answer, and you can trust the Bible. So we can see this happening. He actually sees it in numbers. So you have these magician-type people, okay? And they're searching for God, and they're looking and they run to the church. There are people you're gonna meet in your workplace that are going to seances, that are getting their, their, their signs read, and they're trying to figure out and talk, talk to their mother who passed away or their son who was killed in an automobile accident, and you and I have the answers. And you love them because they're searching. When they're searching, the Bible says, if you search with me all your heart, you'll find me. And so you and I can be that conduit that they would come to know Christ. So don't worry about it. But we need to be equipped to speak the truth in love. So we have expectant worship. These guys were gonna worship the God of the Bible. I believe they were sort of preconditioned to be believers. And they came to worship God. They were expecting God to move. Now why is it that you and I come to church and we expect nothing? Ah, we'll go to church. Ah, I'll read my Bible. I'll just check the box so I can get through the year. What would happen if you and I said, I'm gonna believe God. He's gonna speak to me today as I read the word. What would happen if we came to church saying, I believe God's gonna speak to me when I come to church. Or I'm gonna have a word for somebody else. I'm gonna believe God. I'm gonna expect God to move individually and corporately. And so here you have a group of guys. They're gonna meet, with, meet together the Prince of, Prince of Peace. So come to God with Faith. The Bible says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he or she who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think you need to be diligently seeking God to travel a thousand miles, even in today's age. Some of you won't even get on an airplane. You know why? I heard someone say this to me one time. He said, you know, pastor, I will never go on an airplane. Why? The Bible says, lo, I'm with you always. This is the third service. I get a little loosey-goosey. Okay. Expect, expectant worship and surrendered ex, expression and worship. They have a surrendered expression, expressive, surrendered expressive worship. They were, they, what did the Bible say? Look what, they has, look what they did here. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with, with what? Exceedingly great joy. Because God was speaking to them. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they what? Fell down and worshiped him. So they worshiped God. They were excited. And when they came in, the Bible says they were destroyed. In other words, they they prostrated themselves and were broken. I mean, they were just like, I don't care how high fluting they were, how important they were, how wealthy they were, what the political status was. When they saw Jesus, they laid it all down. They realized, I found the truth. And they broke down and they laid themselves out before Jesus. They were broken before him. Do we do that? Do we come to the point where we're broken before the Lord? Where it's like, you know, God, it's not about me anymore. I'm not gonna worship you on my own terms. They just threw it all away. I'm, I'm, they went down before Jesus. They knew he was the son, he knew he was God. They knew that something extraordinary was happening and they saw Jesus and they went down and they surrendered. You see, one of the things that I wanna encourage you, not only to believe in Jesus, a lot of us believe in Jesus and we're good with that. 
But some of us are not surrendered to Christ. We're not laying our lives down. We're, not, we're, not, we're like, well, Jesus, I'll have you in this. It's almost like we're dating Jesus. We enjoy his company. I like, you know, I like what he does. I like how he talks. But I'm not going to marry him. Hey, Jesus, will you live with me? And Jesus won't live with you. He wants to get married. And we, we fool ourselves. There's only one way we are truly saved. We got to believe in Jesus, and then we have to completely surrender our lives completely to him. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And that's what he asks you to do. Why? Because you're made in his image. One of the phrases I've been coming up with recently is this, our tender is surrender. Our buying power in the kingdom of God, our buying power in the universe is to surrender completely to Jesus. What does Jesus say? I don't care what society says. I don't care what my thoughts or feelings says. I don't care what other Christians are saying. I don't care what the hipster Christians are saying. I don't care what the legalist Christians are saying. I don't want to care what anyone's saying. What does the word of God say? And that is what we must submit ourselves to. And this is the place they were at. So they were expressive in their worship. The Bible says lifting up holy hands. Sometimes I don't feel like coming to church, but I'm going to worship God anyhow because he's worthy of worship. Right? I'm going to worship God whether I feel it or not. Aren't you being a hypocrite? No. I'm turning the thermostat of my emotions to the truth of heaven, and my emotions are going to get there eventually. And so we don't just go to work when we want to go to work, right? We have to what? We have to adapt ourselves to the truth. That's what these guys were doing. And they fell down and they worshiped him. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is the Lord of all. Have you bowed down to Christ? Have you been like the wise men? Or are you just playing around with Jesus? Maybe you're, on, maybe you're in leadership here. I don't know. Maybe you're on the worship team. Maybe you take care of the children. Maybe you've been to Bible school. Maybe you teach. Maybe you sing. I don't know. But have you surrendered to Jesus? If you haven't, you're not really saved. He's not going to live with you until you marry him. Have you married Jesus? And it only happens one way. Complete and total surrender. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Is it yeah, but? There are no more buts. He's either Lord of all or he's Lord of none. He doesn't play around, folks. And so I want to encourage you right now. We're going to pray a prayer in a few moments. Have you ever given your life to Jesus Christ? If you were to die for sure, do you know for certain you'd be in heaven? There's only one way. You must believe that he is the son of God. Died on a cross and rose again and you must be willing to surrender your life to him. If you're not there yet, then you're not saved. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say a prayer in a few moments. I wanna encourage you. How many of you would be honest enough to tell me as I pray, maybe you can join me in this prayer, say, Pastor, I've never given my life to Christ, or I don't frankly know if I ever have done such, but today I want to. Today I'm going all in, full surrender. Anyone want to raise their hand nice and high? Let me see your hand. Say, include me in that prayer. Any, yes, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Several of you in this room. And I don't say that for me, I say that for you. So let's pray this prayer in our heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. Today, Lord, I completely surrender. I declare my life is not my own. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became what Jesus calls born again. There's a cards in front of us. We want to help you in the next journey. Listen, everybody, it's not the end of it all. It's the beginning of it all. And so that's what these guys did. In addition to that, what happened is they had extravagant, sacrificial worship. And I want to encourage you, now that we've prayed that prayer and gave our lives to Christ, at the end of our service, we're going to have our prayer team forward here. If you want to hand your card in, we'll help you. Or at the front desk, we'll give you a Bible, help you on the next path. But right now, we also want to surrender. All of us need to surrender. And one of the ways we surrender is through communion. So if you don't have an um, a element, raise your hand and we'll give it to you. We just ask one basic, two basic things. Number one, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And number two, you must be willing to forgive other people and yourself. Why? Because the Bible tells us we must forgive or we will not be forgiven. Forgiveness never tells anyone Forgiveness does not mean what the other person did 
is correct. It means you're not having to poison yourself. I know I've said this a thousand times probably over the years, but not forgiving someone is like setting yourself on fire and hoping the other person dies of smoke inhalation. Forgiveness, you're not designed to hold on forgiveness. And so what did Jesus do? The bread, he became the sacrificial lamb for us. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it. said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Jesus was broken so you and I could be whole. Jesus understands what it feels like to have seasonal depression. He had a season of depression. He had to go to the cross. Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows what it feels like to be forsaken. And because he was rejected, and because he experienced this, if you give your life to Christ, you never have to face rejection from God. You will never have true separation. You may feel it. And I've dealt with people recently that have been going through difficult times saying, I feel like God has left me. I have anxiety. I I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And I will tell them, listen to me. What you're experiencing is true in your emotions. But listen, Jesus won the war. Right now you're going through this battle, but God is with you. It's a lie that he's forsaken you. He has not forsaken you because Jesus was forsaken. You never have to to be forsaken ever. Never will I forsake you, even unto the end of the age, if we accept Christ. So, though he slay me, I will trust him, as Job said, and you may be going through anxiety attacks, you may be going through all sorts of situations, but I wanna let you know, God is bigger. And sometimes when you're on a roller coaster, you're strapped in, you will survive. I'm gonna ride this roller coaster because I know I'm gonna make it because Jesus' word is true. And I want to encourage you during this time, in this time of the year when people struggle with these various things, that God has done it for you. The Bible says it was cursed at everything that hangs on a tree. He became a curse for us. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases. So can we just lift this for a second? Father, I pray a blessing upon every person here. I pray for healing of minds, of emotions, and of bodies. Father, we're asking that you would make right what's been wrong. Father, we thank you that you have broke sin and death, and by your wounds we are healed. Lord, we're thanking you that we are already healed in you. But Father, we're asking for a down payment on this side of heaven. And Father, we pray even right now as we take this communion, as we eat this wafer, which represents your body, we ask for healing in Jesus' name. Amen. Take, eat. This is my body, which has been given to you. And after they supped, he took the wine. He says, I will not drink this again until I come. Do this as often as you meet until I come again. And so what this is basically declaring, that Christ is coming back to make everything right. What makes us family is a bloodline. The bloodline of Jesus Christ. Take, drink. So, as we look at it, we see these Wise men had expectant worship. They were surrendered to their expression of worship. They were also extravagant, sacrificial worship as well. We can see right here, and when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, and they fell down and worshiped him, and when they had opened their treasures, and when you look at what that means and and the connotation of it, basically, when they went on their journey, they had money to get there. They had money to give him a gift, and they had money to come home. That's a smart traveling plan, right? You don't want to spend it all on vacation and get stuck in vacation. Of course, some of you would like that, but that would not be wise because you'd be arrested. So you want to have money to get there, a gift to give, and money to get back. And the connotation of this is when they had opened their treasures, they're like, they gave it all. They're like, take it all. They extravagantly gave gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, would, and by the way, this area of the world they came from is these are the highest value. These are not cheap gifts. These are the utmost. Gold is, is for kingship. Frankincense is for worship unto God. And myrrh is what you use to anoint a dead body. Do you know when the women came to anoint Jesus' body the day on Sunday, the first day of the week they came, he was not there, but they had myrrh with them. 
So this is also symbolic of what was going to happen to Jesus. And, and also, God provided for Mary and Joseph a big wad of cash so they could leave and go to Egypt to escape the genocide that Herod was going to bring upon boys two years and younger. So God utilized and provided for Mary and Joseph through these pagans who became believers. Watch what God will do. You can't separate worship and giving. Look in the Bible anywhere, you can't find it. Every time there's worship, there's giving of thanks, there's forgiveness, there's always money, there's always exchange involved. And remember, everyone, well, I'm not saying this so we can build a bigger church. I'm, I remember I told you, we're not about that. We're not about giving to get. We get to give. Remember what we spoke about in the previous, God is not blessed giving, he blesses giving with the right heart. And so we don't give to get rich. We give because he freely gave to us. And so I want to encourage you as we do this end of the year offering, this legacy offering, we want to be able to sow seeds to the new uh, building expansion. We also want to help Go Haiti and do a gift for them, a special gift um, for Project Rescue, which rescues people off the streets of sex trafficking over in Europe. We want to help uh, the Israel, is, Israelis and the people living in the Gaza Strip because they all need Jesus. And so we want to give special gifts to these ministries plus the seed forward. And so I encourage you to ask God what you should give. When we asked you last week to think about it, maybe some of you need to think more about it. That's fine. But we want to extravagantly give to what God has given to us in this Christmas season. We don't give to get. We give, we get to give. Remember that, everybody. And my God will supply all of your needs. I guarantee you, God will provide your needs, not your greeds. David said, I've been old, I've been young, and I am old. I've never seen the righteous begging for bread. God will provide for you. But we must believe in our hearts with that. And also, they had expectant worship. You should come to church and read your Bible with a pen in your hand, ready to write down what God's going to say. Surrender. Also, extravagant sacrificial worship and giving, and worship brings divine guidance. I'm going to ask if, if John can make his way out. Divine guidance. You know what happened after they worshiped God? Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed their own country. When they first came to look for Jesus, they had to go to the church to find out what God said. When they worshiped, now the Holy Spirit would speak to them divine guidance. When we lay our life out to him and we are truly, fully worship God, God will lead us in a body, God will lead us individually, and God will lead us in community. Amen? Amen. So we want to end our time here today with worship and also in our giving. There are four different ways you can give to our tithes, and this is a special offering. You know, I encourage you, maybe some of you need to go home and think about it and send it later on today. Take a step of faith. And let's believe God. Why? Because we are your local community. God is calling us to continue to expand to grow. And we get to work together to see his kingdom come and his will be done together. Can we all stand as we worship together?